you're all elite athletes here. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about nutrition for elite athletes. Um, like Olivia said, you know, we're really stuck right now and it's tough to try to improve your athletic performance and still be focused on sports. Um, however, there's never a bad time to focus on nutrition um, and there's tons of ways to improve your nutrition. Um, so just a little bit of background about me. Um, I am a registered dietitian. I went to Western with Olivia and I played on the volleyball team up until 2018. I played there for four years and then I graduated. But during my time at Western, um, I was studying nutrition, but I wasn't actually, especially in my first year and second year, I wasn't actually trying to apply the things that I was learning to being an athlete. However, in third and fourth year, I really enjoyed sports nutrition. I started taking a sports nutrition course and I was like, okay, these things can really apply to what I'm doing on the court. And once I started applying that, um, my athletic performance got way better. Um, I ended up being a um, two-time OUA All-Star, um, academic All-Canadian, and I've represented the province and the country on the international stage. However, I retired in 2018 because I was like, okay, I've had enough of volleyball. I'm going to move on and I just want to help all the athletes coming up through the pipeline, regardless of sport. I want to help them, you know, improve their performance in the same way that I did. Um, so I went on to do my master's at Ryerson. And um, during that time, I did some coursework, some research, and then I actually did an eight month internship. And part of that internship, I moved to Ottawa and worked with the Carleton women's hockey team. So again, hockey is nothing compared to volleyball. So it was really interesting switching over to a sport like that and working with those athletes and seeing the similarities and the differences between volleyball players and um, hockey players. However, there was still um, the whole underlying factor with women in sport, which is body image and making sure that you're fueling properly. So um, it was really interesting working with them and I had a great time, but it taught me that there's so much more work to do, especially with women athletes. Um, so when I graduated, I opened up a private practice, which is Compete Nutrition. I graduated last December. And since then, I've just been trying to work with athletes either one-on-one, -on -one, doing group sessions like this, um, or writing some articles about sports nutrition, just to make sure that everybody knows that nutrition is really important, particularly for athletes. Um, so it's been a wild ride. Um, however, I do also work, I do have a day job, um, but in the evenings and the weekends, I'm 100% dedicated to compete nutrition and it's been really fun. So I'm super excited to be here um, with you guys talking about nutrition because it's really all I think about all day and how interesting it is. So as I mentioned before, I'm just gonna breeze through the main topics of sport nutrition, the main principles, and then I'll open up the floor at the end for a very lengthy question and answer period because um, I'm sure many of you have questions that I can't really touch on um, in this presentation. So I wanted to keep it general and then any specific questions you can ask at the end. So the first thing that I want to clarify is the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian. Honestly, lots of people will call me a nutritionist or a nutritionalist, um, which I don't really care for the title that much, but I feel like it's really important um, for athletes if they, they're wanting to work um, on their nutrition and they're trying to turn to a professional and get some consulting. It's really important to know the difference. Um, however, I do want to see in the chat if um, anybody does have an idea of the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian. <laughs> so you can just put your answers in the chat um, if you know the difference. Uh, no judgment zone, obviously. I can tell you I do not. So. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Most people don't. That's the thing. So I want to um, I want to it's, touch on that a little it's bit. Interesting though, because I and I hope all of you have looked into it, but a lot of your universities do offer. Um, at least some coverage maybe for one or two visits, but I don't even know if that's with the dietitian or a nutritionist. So maybe you can, <laughs> it might be covered by more likely to be covered than uh, with insurance in one versus the other or something like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'll definitely touch on that. So a lot of people in the chat are saying that um, it's red, it's like a regulated title. 
Um, one can give a prescription, the other can't. That's a good point. Um, we're licensed to give professional nutrition advice. Okay, I feel like, Allison, I feel like you might be in the nutrition program because <laughs> that was a really great answer. <laughs> and um, Bella, dietitian is certified while a nutritionist isn't. So very valid points. Everybody, you pretty much hit the nail on the head there. Um, basically, anybody can call themselves a nutritionist but not everybody can call themselves a dietitian. So if you are looking for that like one-on-one -on -one session, <laughs> if you are looking for some consulting um, and you are looking at a nutritionist, there's no way to know really if they have, maybe they've taken a weekend course or they have a whole PhD in nutrition. It's really hard to know and education time varies so much. Um, however, they could be really experienced and knowledgeable um, but you just have to do some extra digging to figure that out. Um, and again, they're not regulated by a provincial body. Um, and that's to protect the public against like professional misconduct. So on the dietitian side, we all have an undergraduate degree. I think the majority of us now have master's degrees. We've done the eight month internship. We've done the board exam um, and we're all registered with the provincial body. So um, you know that you're getting across the board when you see a dietitian, you're pretty much gonna get um, a similar experience. And um, that registration with the provincial body is really important to protect you guys from professional misconduct, um, or even just like giving you plain wrong advice. <laughs> so um, as a dietitian, we're required to do continuous learning and professional development. But, um, and then as Olivia said, services from a registered dietitian are typically able to be claimed under most insurance plans. Um, whereas with the nutritionist, it probably isn't. And that's one of, the, even when I work with clients one-on-one -on -one, um, and they're like, yeah, my, my insurance covers it. Um, and we're like, okay, great. Let's do a couple of sessions. And then after that, they're like, oh, it turns out like it doesn't actually cover it just because it doesn't cover nutrition care. Um, but if it does cover nutrition care, it's usually a dietitian. So um, yeah, really, if you're working with a dietitian, you're gonna get pretty much the same thing across the board, which is great. And now moving on to the good stuff, sports nutrition principles. Can anybody tell me why nutrition is important for athletic performance? And no nutrition students can answer this question because <laughs> y'all already know. <laughs> Yeah, good point. Using muscles, gotta feed them. Anybody else have any insight into why it's important to focus on what we're eating? Give us energy. Yep, food is fuel, that's for sure. Yes, there is a mind-body connection, especially when you bring food into the puzzle. Quality of the food means the quality of performance. Awesome. And what you eat also helps recovery and building of muscles. So fantastic. You guys already know how important nutrition is. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of key points. So for the most part, nutrition really is going to work with your training, your practices, um, sleep schedule, anything you're doing throughout the day. It's just going to work with those activities to help you get stronger, help you get faster, um, help you get focused. So that mental component is really big. Um, and then also eating enough throughout the day is really going to help reduce your risk for injury and illness, which is something that is so huge, especially in um, women athletes. That is typically like when we're growing up, we're not really taught how detrimental it is to not eat enough throughout the day. So I'll touch on that in a little bit. But the last thing is get energized. Again, food is fuel. You need it if you're going to really do anything. Um, your body's like a car, so you got to give it some gas. And this is the pyramid of optimal athletic performance. So at the top, we have game day. And when I'm referring to athletic performance, I'm actually talking about both physical and mental performance, which this might actually tie well into your next session with, I think, Dr. Wade, is that, is that their name? Yeah, with Dr. Wade, because it will um, influence your athletic and your mental performance. So on game day, this is when you want everything to be working together. You want um, to be making the right decisions. You want to be as strong and as fast as possible. Um, and you want to be able to recover well and be injury and illness free. 
Um, so this is when nutrition is really important because if you eat something terrible before game day and you're like having indigestion on the court or sorry, on the field and heartburn on the field, that's a terrible feeling and you don't wanna have that. So nutrition can actually direct, directly affect performance on game day just by eating either a great pregame meal or a terrible pregame meal. Um, however, you can't just really show up on game day and expect to be 100% playing your best. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into game day. These are things like practicing um, and strength and conditioning. So being in the gym or it could be running. Um, maybe right now you're probably running outside. Um, also injury management is a huge thing. I'm assuming in women's football, it's huge as well because it's, it's more of a contact sport and then also motivation as well with the mental game. So all these things work together. If you can't practice well, you're not gonna play well. So you need to be able to fuel properly so you can do all these things in the middle as best as you can. So all of this is just going to translate to a better game day performance. So you gotta fuel for practices, you gotta fuel well, and then you also gotta fuel for games too. And so really nutrition is gonna help you get the most out of your training. So that way you can excel on game day or your tournament days. And again, proper nutrition can reduce your risk for illness and injury, which is huge because if you're not eating enough, there's a whole bunch of things that can go wrong in your body. Um, and we just really want to avoid that. And then also nutrition, good food is gonna fuel your body and mind. And this is important for off the court as well, or sorry. <laughs> have it off the field as well. And then finally, it's going to re decrease recovery time in between your training sessions. So this is huge. Um, if you're somebody who likes to work out every day, um, or maybe you have a workout and then you have practice the next day, or you might work out and then have a tournament the next day, it's really important that that time in between those activity sessions is used to recover. And nutrition is going to help you do that more effectively. So this is my favorite sports nutrition quote, which is proper diet can't make an average athlete elite, but a poor diet makes an elite athlete average. Meaning that like you could eat the best diet in the world, you could eat the best food in the world, but you're still not gonna be LeBron James, unfortunately. Um, however, if you are not eating well and you're LeBron James, you're not gonna play well. <laughs> so really, Proper nutrition is gonna make you the best athlete that you can be. It's gonna help you reach your full potential as an athlete. Um, but also on the other side, if you're not eating well, it's even if you're the best athlete in the world, it's probably going to show on the court. Um, and it's gonna make you play not so great. Sorry, on the field, oh my goodness, it's such a habit to say court. <laughs> Um, and so a lot of questions I get from athletes are, are you fueling properly? Like, how do you know if you're actually fueling properly? And these are some common signs. These are like some mental signs that you might be noticing where you're tired and cranky, um, maybe at the end of a tournament day after playing like five games, you're just not trying to talk to anybody. Um, you're distracted. This could be maybe practices or in the gym at the end of the session, you just cannot focus. This is a very common one. Um, and then also being unmotivated, that could be a big sign that you're not eating or drinking enough as well. And these are some more signs which are more physical, which is um, fading in the last part of your training sessions. Um, also bad decision-making could be maybe you're hungry and distracted. Um, but also a slow reaction time, just feeling weak throughout the session. And a big one is you're always injured. So if you have um, an injury that's just never getting better, um, it's just not healing, this could be a sign that you're just not fueling enough to help your body recover properly. Um, and then the last one is no endurance. So you just run out of steam. Um, these are more physical signs that you're not eating and drinking enough. Um, and I'll get into what you can do to fix that in a little bit. Okay, but first I gotta talk about macronutrients, really get back to the basics here. Really, when you think about sports nutrition, it really comes down to the macronutrients. So really carbs and protein um, and a little bit of fat, but also water plays a huge role in that. Um, so 
these are the three main macronutrients if you're not familiar with them. Um, the first one is carbohydrates. So this is what provides energy to your muscles and your brain as well to fuel your training. Um, again, your body is like a car. So think of carbs as gas. If you don't have any gas in the tank, you can't go anywhere. So you have to fuel up and you have to eat carbohydrates. I know that carbohydrates have gotten a bad rep in the past, um, but for athletes, especially when you're playing three to five games a day, you have to be fueling up with carbohydrates because these are the main source of fuel for your muscles and your brain. I mean, your brain and your muscles can, well, mostly your muscles could actually work off of protein and fats for energy, but um, just not as efficient as carbohydrates. <laughs> so eat your carbs, um, eat your ice cream. And um, the next one is protein. This is super key and it gets even more important as you get older and maybe even after you have retired from football. But really, protein provides the building blocks for building any muscles, your bones, ligaments, and it supports a really strong immune system, which might be important these days. But for the most part, it's really important to have protein, especially when you're an athlete, because you're working hard, you're really working those muscles. So you have to be able to replenish um, your body with protein so you can, your muscles can use those building blocks to build more muscle and get those gains. And then finally, um, fats, another macronutrient that gets a lot of hate. Um, it's really important for delivering nutrients to the cell. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with fat soluble vitamins, but there are certain vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin D, um, and vitamin E and vitamin K, which are fat soluble vitamins. And basically you need fats in order to even absorb these and get these fat, uh, get these nutrients to where they need to go. Also, we're all sitting down right now and we're using fat as our main energy source. Um, or even when you're exercising at really low intensities, fats are really important to provide that energy. So carbohydrates are our main source when it's like high intensity, you know, you're on the field, you're running. Um, but when we're sitting down, we are actually mainly using fat as an energy source. So these are the three macronutrients. And as you can tell, they're all very important for athletes. Um, and then the final one that I consider a macronutrient is water. And it is so important to stay hydrated. Um, it doesn't have to be water. It really could be anything, but I do prefer water as my drink of choice. And really our bodies are made up of over 50% water. So when you're on the field, you're playing, or you're even practicing or in the gym, if you lose even 2% of your body water, it's really going to have detrimental effects on your athletic performance. Um, and that could be as little as like losing three pounds. So when I was working with the Carlton women's hockey team, um, one of our activities was to weigh yourself before and after a training session. And if you lost a certain amount of weight from sweat um, or just from breathing heavily, because they're wearing lots of gear, so they sweat a lot more. Um, so they're losing water through sweat. If they lose over maybe like sometimes three pounds or four pounds in sweat, that means that they were not hydrating enough. So um, it's really important that you are staying hydrated because you don't wanna lose body weight in water because this is really going to affect your athletic performance because your body's gonna get overheated and it's just a mess. Um, but before I move on to fueling up and some more principles, does anybody have questions about the macronutrients or water? Um, oh, got a question from Olivia. What are your thoughts on protein powder versus natural sources of protein? This is a really great, quest great question. And oh, wow. Okay, no, we got tons of questions up here. <laughs> I just saw them. Um, so this is a good question about the protein powder. And really, I'm a big fan of protein powder. Honestly, full disclosure, I do work at a company that creates a protein powder for a clinical population, so in the hospital. So I do understand the importance of protein powder. However, for athletes, I would prefer you guys get your protein from actual food sources because one, it's gonna provide a lot more calories, which we need because we're expending a lot more energy. And it's also gonna provide other nutrients. So if you think of like um, a chicken breast, it's not just protein that you're getting from that. You're also getting a little bit of fat and a ton of micronutrients and vitamins in there, or maybe not vitamins, but. 
Um, and then also on the, but on the protein powder side, it can be really effective, especially because you're all students. So you're super busy, um, especially once we get back in person and you're running around from class to class to the gym. Um, it's, that could be a really great time to use protein powder because it's quick and it's easy and it's gonna get you what you need in order to recover. Um, so there's uses for both, um, but ideally we wanna get most of our sources from food sources. However, if you are gonna use a protein powder, I would recommend a whey protein isolate. Um, and then another question that we got is, what is a good source of protein for vegetarians? Great question, because I know plant-based is actually um, huge right now and I'm huge on plant-based protein sources. So for this, I'm a really, really big fan of legumes, which are foods like chickpeas, beans, and lentils, um, especially for athletes because they provide tons of plant-based protein, but they also provide a lot of carbohydrates. Um, so, and tons of vitamins and minerals as well, and lots of fiber. So really they're a great food because they're good for you and they're healthy, but they're also amazing because they do provide that plant-based protein. Um, another source could be nuts and um, seeds. So like chia seeds, black seeds, almonds, things like that. Those are also great sources. Um, and vegetarians, it depends what label you use, but that could also include maybe some cheese as well. Like cottage cheese is a really great source. Um, depending on how, how, um, how you feel about certain animal products. Um, and then um, another question, in terms of carbs, is brown whole grain best? Yes, big time. Um, you can definitely get a lot more nutrients from the whole grains um, or the brown rice, brown bread. Um, however, if you're not a huge fan of it, you can always try to like mix them together. So if you don't like brown rice, you can try white rice mixed in with brown rice. But if you're a huge fan of white rice, like I've, it's not, um, you could still have it. I would say like maybe sometimes try to bring in quinoa on some days or like oatmeal or something just to try to switch it up. Awesome, okay. Um, great round of questions there, everybody. Um, if you have any more, just throw them in the chat. But uh, I think I'm gonna move on now to fueling up. So this is referring to how to fuel for your day and then also how to fuel for a training session, um, a practice, and then also even tournaments as well. So fueling for your day is more important than what you're eating before a game because you need to meet your total daily calorie needs to give you enough energy so you can do everything that you need to do throughout the day. So even right now, we're just sitting here doing nothing. You could be lying in bed all day no judgment, I do that sometimes, <laughs> but you're still burning calories. So um, if you're not eating enough to support those calorie needs, how are you going to actually go out and play an entire football game? Um, there's, there's no way. And that, that's that part that really increases your risk for injury or illness because you're just not giving yourself enough calories to even just sit in bed all day. Um, so again, fueling for your day is really important because it's going to support you just for your activities that you're doing um, outside of sports. So sitting in bed all day, sleeping, uh, maybe walking the dog, walking to class, you need energy for all those things. But when you're an athlete, you need a lot more energy to be able to do your, uh, what you need to do on the field as well. Um, so fueling enough and eating consistently throughout the day is really gonna help you go 100% during your training sessions and fuel your body for what you need to do. And again, if you're not meeting these calorie needs, you're putting yourself at a big risk for injury and illness. Um, so if you're not eating enough, it has impacts on your bone health, your ligament health, your muscle health, even your like gut health and your gastrointestinal health um, which is crazy. There's so much research out there that says that if you don't eat enough and you're an athlete, it's really going to affect like every system in your body, um, your hormonal health as well. Um, and then there's one more that I'm thinking, oh, the immune system. It's going to affect the immune system if you're not eating enough. So that's why for athletes, um, the first thing I ask them is like, okay, what is your, what does your day look like? Like walk me through a typical day. Um, let's start with the first meal of the day. And so um, sometimes 
athletes will be like, I don't have my first meal of the day until 2 p.m. I'm like, okay, let's work on eating breakfast. That is the most most important meal of the day still. Um, I definitely am a big supporter of that um, tagline, mainly because for athletes, like breakfast is a huge opportunity to get a lot of calories in. So it's really important to meet your calorie needs. And a great way to do that is through breakfast. Because if you think of a bowl of oatmeal or a smoothie, like you can pack a lot of calories in there and it'll keep you going throughout the day. Um, and Oh, we got the neuro coming in. <laughs> Gut microbes are so important for even the brain. Yes, that's a huge thing. I'm so interested in how gut health and fiber can really influence um, your mental health and um, how the brain works. Um, yep, healthy immune system really matters. Thank you for bringing that up, Tay, big time. And so for athletes, I would say, if you're struggling to eat breakfast, um, just make sure that that first meal of the day, whenever you do get a chance to have it, has some sort of carbohydrate for energy and also some protein. Um, Cause those are super key macronutrients that you need in order to do what you need to do on the field. Um, so for the most part, usually a typical eating habit or eating pattern is three meals a day. Make sure you get breakfast in and also try to get two snacks in, especially on days where you have a training session or you're um, working out. And then on tournament days, those two snacks turn into like 60 snacks. So <laughs> I'll get into that a little bit later, but this is pre-training nutrition. So this can refer to before a practice, before um, a training session at the gym, before you go for a run. Um, just know that before you go, you gotta get the cho, all right? That is my, uh, my like slogan for <laughs> pre-training nutrition. Um, and basically the CHO stands for carbohydrates, which is the C and the HO is H2O, which refers to fluids because again, like you want to go into your training sessions fueled up with that gas tank full. And you also want to make sure that you're well hydrated because if you go in relatively under hydrated, that just puts you at more risk for hydration issues. And that's going to really influence your performance in a bad way. So you want to get carbs and fluids before you go out there. And um, this is if you have maybe like half an hour um, or 45 minutes before your training session, you really want to focus on getting those carbs and fluids in. Um, and you can do that through, these are just some examples, but like pretzels, hummus and orange juice could be one, a granola bar and fruit. Um, really like carbohydrates refer to any grain, pasta, rice, um, bread, and also fruits as well. So, and legumes have carbs in them. I almost forgot to mention that. Wow. Um, so these are all carbohydrate sources, but for the most part, you can get by with like a banana and some water, maybe like half an hour before your session. However, as time goes on, so say you have like three hours before your nighttime practice or something and it's 5 p.m. you got practice at eight and you're like okay I'm, I'm gonna eat now and I don't really want to eat right before practice so I should have a big meal um after at that time that would be a good time just to have a full meal um just make sure you have carbohydrates and you're drinking some water with your meals and you also get a little bit of protein there so that can really be anything but you just want to make sure that there's carbs on your plate um, and you're drinking some water. So, however, if you have less time and there's only maybe one to two hours in between your, your meal and your practice or your game, that would be a time to just kind of make sure that it's still like a decent size snack. So it fills you up, but you also get some protein in there um, because protein is going to help you feel full and uh, never a bad idea to get more protein in. And then also this pre-training nutrition tip can also be used for um, tournament days. Before your tournament, you wanna make sure that you're getting, you're hydrated, um, which you can start actually the day before just by drinking enough water. And then also you wanna make sure you're getting carbs in before your first game of the day. Okay, and I saw we had a couple of questions pop up. Um, 
Yeah. So tournaments, this is the thing, like they, you're playing so many games throughout the day and it's really, really intense. So you want to make sure that you got carbs there all the time. So even with my like athletes who are like eight years old, <laughs> like soccer teams and stuff, I'm like, make sure you have bench snacks. All right. So bring, bring an orange, bring a banana to keep on the bench with you because um, I'm sure you guys rotate um, through the lineups and stuff. You want to make sure that when you're off, you're using that time to recover. So that's when you go for the water and you're going for the carbohydrates as well. Um, another question, how do you prevent feeling heavy or sluggish um, post eating and heading into a game slash practice? So this is a really good question because when you're practicing, you want to do the same thing with nutrition. You want to practice your like pregame meals and um, pregame snacks as like you're practicing for your game. So when you're going to a practice or maybe it's a workout that's like not super um, important, that's when you can try out all these snacks, all these meals to see how your body works um, after you've used these. So usually I wouldn't recommend just going out and trying something new on your tournament days. You just want to make sure that you've practiced it ahead of time. Um, so maybe right now, if you're working out at home, um, it would be a good time to try creating that list of pregame snacks and pregame meals to use um, for when you get back on the field. And, um, but for the most part, you want to stay away from foods that are super high in, um, in fiber. So unfortunately this means like beans and chickpeas, that's like 30 minutes before your game. You want to stay away from that. Um, but also you want to stay away from foods that are really high in fat. Cause this could actually induce heartburn, um, and just make you feel, um, like you're using a lot of energy to digest it. So the less time you have before a game or a session, you want to go for more simpler carbs. So the, this is where the white rice can come in and um, crackers and fruits and juice and things like that. Um, does it matter when you have protein after exercising? Should it be shortly after or is it the total daily intake that matters? Great question, Allison. Um, total daily intake is going to trump whatever you're doing around um, your exercise sessions. So ideally for athletes, I would love for you all to have protein at all of your snacks and meals, um, just to make sure that you're getting those like protein boluses throughout the day. Um, because at any given time throughout the day, you're either building muscle or you're losing muscle. And it's just in really small increments, but if you can consistently be in that building muscle phase, you don't have to worry about losing muscle. So that's why I recommend to have those like bursts of protein throughout the day. Um, everybody needs a team mom snack for, or team mom for snack duty. That's a really good one. <laughs> so somebody's gonna be in charge of cutting up all the oranges and bringing them to practice. Um, I was told to have lots of fast sugar foods between games. Is that correct? Even a juice box? Yes, I think that is a good idea. You can use a juice box. But I mean, there's always a good opportunity to try to maximize the amount of nutrients that you're getting throughout the day, even if it's in between games. So honestly, if you have like 10 minutes in between games, definitely go for the juice box. But if you have an hour, that's when you want to try to get in something that's a little bit more whole. You can go for um, a banana or like a banana roll up, which is you just get a tortilla whole grain and you put peanut butter and a banana on top and then you roll it up. Um, that would be like a more nutrient dense meal. Um, but it depends on how much time you have. So I would say under 30 minutes, you can get by with juice or Gatorade, especially because you're playing outside. Um, you might be sweating more depending on the weather. Um, that would be a good time for Gatorade, but it's never a bad idea to have fruit on the bench or like berries or something like that. Um, but fast sugar foods would be ideal in those situations. Okay, moving on to recovery. So another corny line, training doesn't stop until you get the chop. And the chop refers to the cho plus protein. <laughs> so you need to make sure that you're getting carbohydrates in, you're getting your fluids in, and you're getting your protein in. And this is really key because after any training session, you have just used all of your energy to train or to play um, on the field. And so you've emptied your gas tank. So you actually need to fill that gas tank up again. And this is super important for tournament days.
because again, you have that really tiny window in between your games. You need to be able to refill that gas tank really effectively and efficiently. So this is this could be where the fast carbs come in, um, but there's nothing wrong with an orange um, or Gatorade. So that works as well, especially tournament days. But even if you have a workout one day and then the next day you have a practice, that's still only a day to recover. So I know sometimes you might have a really tough workout and it takes you three days to not feel sore anymore. <laughs> so that period of time is when you're recovering. And even if you have practices a day apart, you need to be fueling, refueling with carbohydrates because right after that practice is when your body is just going to suck in all those carbs and use them for what they need to be used for. Um, another one is fluids. Again, super important. It's likely that you have lost fluids during, during your um, game or training session. And this is because we're sweating, we're breathing heavily, so we're losing water. So you just need to replenish that water to make sure that you're not dehydrated. And then finally, protein, super important. Um, somebody already had mentioned that, um, again, your muscles have been working so hard during this training session or during this game, and you need to rebuild those muscles. So you need to give your muscles the thing that it's made out of, protein, in order to get those gains. Um, and so it is really important to have protein throughout the day, but I just like to have it up here because it's going to remind you that after your game or your practice, you need to get that protein in. You just need to remember to eat protein. So sometimes that could be a post, um, a post practice snack where you might only have time for like a smoothie or a protein shake, but lots of people will come home from practice and make dinner. So usually that's when they're getting in their protein. Um, but if you're on the go, it's really important to remember that you do need that protein. And so I usually say this recovery, this recovery snack is either going to be within the hour after your training session or your game. Um, and again, it can be either a meal or a snack. Um, just depends on your schedule. But um, recovery nutrition is super important for tournament days. Again, like three to five games, hour long. You're burning so much energy throughout the day. In between games, you need to be recovering, using that time to recover. So you need to be rehydrating, you need to be fueling up the gas tank with carbohydrates, and you need to be um, chugging back some protein. <laughs> so a good, um, a really good post in between game meal would be like, depends how much time you have, but you could have a banana with like an egg, and that would be enough to get you through to the next game, or you could make it into a bigger meal. Um, oftentimes, depending on how well you tolerate yogurt, um, I really recommend Greek yogurt um, because it's got a ton of protein in it. It's got some carbohydrates in it, and it also contains a little bit of fluid. So yogurt is a really great snack to have um, to help you during that recovery period. But sometimes it's a little tough on people's stomachs, so you just got to practice that one first. Um, and then there's also nothing wrong with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So <laughs> that's also another great recovery nutrition snack. And then um, I have a couple of suggestions here. Again, training doesn't stop until you get the chop. So after any physical activity, you just wanna make sure that you are remembering the chop principle um, before you do anything else. You wanna make sure that you're getting all these components when you, when you um, make your meal or your snack. So sometimes a smoothie is a great idea. You get a lot of calories in here and you get a lot of nutrients. Um, you can add protein powder in here too, as well. Um, that would be, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Also again, Greek yogurt and a banana, great po like recovery snack. Um, especially because Greek yogurt, you can get it in tiny containers and that tiny container contains about 17 grams of protein, which is quite a bit. Um, and then again, you can do something that's super basic, which is just cheese and crackers with some fruit. Um, or you could do a granola bar, chocolate milk. That was a big one when I was playing volleyball. Um, also Gatorade is a good option um, with some sort of protein. And then uh, this one was just, it was just an idea I wanted to throw out there, but you could do like sandwich meat with cream cheese and crackers. And again, don't forget fluids, especially on those tournament days. In between games, you need to be rehydrating because 
if if it came down to it, if you weren't, um, if one athlete wasn't hydrated enough and then another athlete didn't have enough carbohydrates, the person who's going to fall flat first is the one who's not hydrated enough. So it's really important that you're prioritizing hydration, but you're also getting those carbs in. Okay, let's see, any questions? Oh, I'm on low FODMAPs. What should you suggest I eat during games? This is a really good question. And honestly, with a low FODMAP diet, for those of you who don't know, um, FODMAP, low FODMAP diets are, um, you're really just trying to choose a list of foods that work for you to prevent any bloating, gas, or any gastrointestinal issues. So um, there's foods that will have will not have any of these components in them. And this is really good if you do have that bloating um, or any gas throughout a game. Um, however, it's really dependent on the person. So some people might benefit from eating something that does have some FODMAPs in it and some people might not be able to eat that food. So it's really individual. I don't think I can answer that right now, <laughs> but I can provide a list for you and maybe I can send it to you, Olivia. I can just give you some suggestions um, afterwards, and then um, you can forward that on. Um, somebody says boiled eggs are one of the most slept on foods. Thank you for pointing that out. I almost forgot because eggs, eggs are amazing. So they provide in one little egg, it provides six grams of protein and it's super high quality protein. So this is a protein that's going to give you all of your essential amino acids and really help stimulate that muscle protein synthesis. So one egg has six grams of protein, but it also contains really healthy fats and omega-3s. Um, omega-3s are great for inflammation or reducing inflammation. And um, so if you are somebody who is in a pinch and you're like, I don't know what to make, but I need some protein in right now because I got it, I, I need the chop. <laughs> you can just have a, bo a boiled egg or a fried egg. Um, I'm actually Ghanaian and in Ghanaian culture, we love boiled eggs. We throw them in every, every single dish. So I've grown up eating boiled eggs and they are really slept on. So eggs are a great food to have. Um, even at tournaments, it depends how well you can digest them, but it might be a good thing to have as a bench snack. You just got to put it in the cooler and you can have um, eggs on the side. It might smell a little funny, but that's okay. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Um, what would you suggest for bloating and improving digestion? Even with training and proper meals, still feel the bloat. That is a really good question. Maybe I can provide the, the low FODMAP foods to you as well. But really with bloating, you just want to make sure that you're, you know, eating consistently throughout the day. You're not um, distracted. So you're not like breathing in more um, while you're eating. And also really simple things like trying to stay away from refined sugars, um, maybe eating more whole grain foods. There's a lot of things that can actually influence the bloating, um, but for the most part, um, maybe the low FODMAP diet might be of interest to you. And then is there a rule of thumb for how much water we should be consuming? I know some people say an ounce for every kilogram of body weight, others say two liters regardless. What do you think? This is a great question and obviously it's different for everybody as athletes you're probably losing at least 500 milliliters while you're in a training session or in a game um, so for athletes it's going to be a lot higher than that two liter mark that everybody says um, when i was in school we learned that uh, for women you want to get 2.7 liters of fluid in every day and that includes like foods like soup even fruits and vegetables which contain a little bit of water um, however, when I got into my later years, we learned that you want to just make sure you're getting the same amount of milliliters as you are consuming in calories. So that's a little bit different, but for the most part, I would say for athletes, you need to be drinking water at every single meal. Um, and just carry a water bottle around with you. Really, if you are looking at your urine and it's darker than it should be, that's a good indicator that you need to be drinking more. Um, and a really good way to know if you're not drinking enough, especially around practice time or game time, is um, to weigh yourself. So weigh yourself before and then weigh yourself after. If there is like more than three to four pounds of weight loss, you're not drinking enough. 
Um, but for me personally, I just try to drink whenever I think about it. <laughs> and if it means sitting at my desk with a water bottle, then so be it. But really a good place to start is just making sure you're drinking at least maybe a cup or two with every single meal. Okay. Um, and then Emily says wheat, onion, and garlic. Those are big, big FODMAP foods. So maybe if you are having that issue with bloating, it could be um, related to certain foods that you're eating. And then at that point, it's just kind of an elimination diet. You just got to get rid of everything and then add each food in individually. Um, I'm somebody, I could look at water and just get bloated. So I'm, just, I'm over it. <laughs> I'm like, I'll just be bloated. It's fine. <laughs> Um, and then another question about the cholesterol level in eggs. And really, if you don't have um, cardiovascular disease or any sort of high cholesterol issue to begin with, you're definitely okay to be consuming eggs throughout the day. Um, even for those populations that do have a cholesterol issue, we say you can have one egg a day and you'll be okay. <laughs> so um, for a general population who is exercising a lot, um, you're definitely okay to be continuing with eating eggs um, because eggs are going to provide other things than just the protein and the fat. They also provide those fat soluble vitamins that are super important for um, healthy cells and healthy bodies. But also don't try to have five, six eggs a day. That's very popular in Guinean culture. <laughs> so I would say maybe one, two, one, two, two to three, whatever you can fit. Um, somebody says we love complete protein sources. Yes. Um, which is also kind of tough to do with, um, a vegetarian diet, but most foods that you're eating together, like you're having rice and beans together, or rice and peas, um, those foods commonly go together and that creates a complete protein source. So for the most part, if you're getting protein in from even plant-based sources, it's going to be likely that you will eventually eat it with something that will make it a complete source. Um, I definitely eat too quick and breathe it all in. I'm dead. <laughs> Even like chewing gum could be a reason for bloating as well. There's, there's so many um, different, different answers to that question. Um, as a nutritionist, what are your thoughts on taking supplements and vitamins? Oh, great question. I was waiting for somebody to ask this. So now that we're all inside and it's winter time, every, we should all be taking vitamin D. It's actually part of like the health Canada's, um, health Canada's directive right now to make sure that Canadians over 50 are taking vitamin D. But now that we're inside, and I don't know, maybe some of you are women of color who have darker skin. It's harder to absorb vitamin D from the sun. Um, we need more vitamin D. So I would recommend, oh, good question. How much vitamin D? At least a thousand IU. It really depends. Um, most people will actually take more than a thousand IU, but I think legally as a dietitian, I'm only allowed to say to take a thousand. I take a thousand. You can take 2000, but um, my recommendation would be at least a thousand. Um, maybe talk to your doctor and see if you can get some blood work done. Um, and depending on what your vitamin D levels look like, they might prescribe like 3000, 4000 IU. Amanda, <laughs> um, you should take vitamin D. <laughs> and um, let's see. Okay. Kelly, I take two vitamin D a day in the winter. I think that's pretty reasonable, honestly. And um, the maximum amount of vitamin D you can take, really, this is unknown. Um, the toxicity, there is a general number, but I know people who've taken like, I, I think it's 4,000. I have to look that up. Um, but I know there are people who have taken like 6,000 IU a day and like have been fine. So <laughs> it really depends. Um, but start with a thousand and see how that goes. But vitamin D is super important because it's going to help your immune system. It's going to help your mood. Um, it's going to help with sleep. And it's just going to help. Like if you're deficient in vitamin D, it just creates a lot more issues for other things. So um, any sort of illness that you might get, it might having a low vitamin D level might actually make that worse. Is there such thing as too much vitamin C? Uh, you can pee it out. Wait, are you referring to vitamin D or vitamin C? 
Vitamin D. Okay. Yeah. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So you're probably just going to store it. Um, but if you take it as a supplement, that's a good question. Just start with a thousand. <laughs> I don't want to lead anybody down the wrong path. Um, actually, I'm going to look that one up for you. Let me make a note of that. So FODMAPs and, um, and vitamin D levels. Sorry guys, as I, full disclosure, as a registered dietitian, um, for the most part, our main strength is actually like looking up information, researching information and finding the correct answer as opposed to like just knowing everything because <laughs> there's so much to know about nutrition. So a lot of the time I'm like, I'm sorry, uh, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So let me look that up and get back to you. It's my alarm. All right. And what are your thoughts on meal replacement shakes? Are there certain aspects that we should be looking for when choosing one? This is a great, great question. I'm honestly not a huge fan of meal replacement shakes. And yes, you can get all of your nutrients um, from them, but if you're just drinking a beverage, it's not as filling, filling as eating a full meal. And even though like we are trying to fuel you guys as athletes, um, it's also really important to just be um, healthy and enjoy food and have a good relationship with food. So part of that is like making a meal and enjoying it and not feeling like you're hungry or restricting yourself. So with meal replacement shakes, I feel like it's easy just to make the shake and um, get all your nutrients from that, but you're not actually enjoying the food and it's likely that you're going to be hungry like half an hour later because it doesn't provide all the nutrients that a full meal of like food would provide. And also in meal replacement shakes, sometimes they might add things in there that you don't need or there might be too much. Um, and that's sort of the similar question about supplements because there's so many supplements out there that claim these like ridiculous things and half the time they're not even true. I actually just read an article about HMB, which is a supplement that's supposed to make you gain like crazy muscle gains. Um, but they just found out through meta-analysis that it doesn't do anything. So the same could be said with meal replacement shakes and they could be putting like crazy levels of vitamins in there that you actually don't need and might, it could potentially be toxic. Cause say you're taking your vitamin D supplement and then you take a meal replacement that has 6,000 IU vitamin D in it, then you're just getting way too much. Um, so I'd recommend just sticking with food. Um, can athletes get away with fast foods than the average? <laughs> Good question. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of like fast food. I love Popeyes. I love McDonald's. So um, I would never say like, just cut it out completely. But after a big tournament day or even a weekend of playing like five games a day, you totally deserve to go get that Popeyes or maybe you're having a bad day and you want to get something good to eat. That would definitely be a good time. I would just say more often than not, you know, you're choosing not to do that. But um, for the most part, go get your McDonald's, go, <laughs> go get your Popeyes. Um, and then have some more questions, especially during quarantine, fast foods are my kryptonite. I'm dead. I feel that one too. Um, for me, usually I try to do Monday to Friday. I mean, business, I'm eating my three meals a day. I'm eating at least four servings of vegetables. Uh, I'm drinking water. And then on the weekends, I'm like, okay, I can like kind of, um, I can bring these foods into like my rest days, which are my weekends. Um, Kelly says, I started taking it 10 years ago and I've had way less cold flu. Yeah, vitamin D has a huge influence on your um, immune system. Uh, what are your thoughts on iron supplements? This is a great question because so many women are iron deficient. And as athletes, like I really, so even just women in general, like we are losing more iron. We do need more iron than um, another gender. But um, as athletes, we are running around. We're like using so much more iron because we need to bring more energy and more, sorry, more oxygen to our muscles. Um, so it's really important that you're getting blood work done pretty regularly. I'd say like maybe once a year on your iron to make sure that you're not iron deficient. Um, I would never recommend just going and taking an iron supplement 
without knowing if you're actually deficient because um, there's risk there for toxicity. Um, but especially if you are iron deficient, that's really going to affect your athletic performance and just your day-to-day -day activities. So I would say you want to make sure that you're having that conversation with your doctor um, and getting that blood work done so you know if you need to be taking an iron supplement. Um, and for things like that, like if you do have a vitamin or mineral deficiency, you should be taking a supplement. It's just when you don't have that and you're still taking the supplement, there might be like, there's no reason to do that. <laughs> you're just getting extra supplements and sometimes wasting money. Uh, for that sit down meal, looking at a plate, what would be the ideal portion of those main nutrients? This is a great question. Um, is there a go-to meal prep you would suggest? So the athlete's plate, hmm, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, hmm. I'm just going to actually, oh yeah, this is for the Q&A. I do have some questions that you guys had left, but I'll save those for the end. Let me just pull up the athlete's plate. Okay, and I'm just gonna share my screen again quickly. Okay, so this is the athlete's plate. It was created by um, USOC, which is the United States Olympic Committee. And for the most part, during our day-to-day -day activities, we wanna be following this plate, which looks very much like the food guide. Um, has anybody here seen the new Canada's food guide? It looks like a plate. <laughs> so it pretty much looks like this training plate where you're getting half your plate is fruits and vegetables, a quarter is protein, and then a quarter is whole grains. I actually don't know if I can make that bigger. Perfect, okay. So this is your easy training day or like just an off day. Um, you wanna make sure that you're getting all those fruits and veggies in simply because they're good for you. And again, you wanna have protein at all snacks and meals. So a quarter of your plate is fine. That also refers to like a serving size, the size of the palm of your hand. And this is for protein. And then also you still wanna get your carbs in even though you're not exercising simply because you're, you're not not using your brain. So you still need carbohydrates. Um, we just recommend using whole grains um, more often than not. But you can still have white rice, totally fine. Uh, I just recommend bringing in sometimes quinoa and oatmeal whenever you get a chance. So this is on your off days or your light training days. And then we have our moderate training days. So this could be, uh, you have a tough two hour practice or you're in the gym for two hours doing a HIIT workout. This is when you can pull out a moderate training plate, which still the protein is the same simply because your body can't really metabolize more protein than this at one time. That's another reason why it's important to have those pulses of protein throughout the day. Um, but you're still getting lots of veggies. You're just increasing the carbohydrate intake because you need that for energy throughout your practices. So this is what all your meals are gonna look like throughout that day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to help support your physical activity through providing more carbohydrates and more gas for your body. And then finally, this is what tournament days are gonna look like. Even though it's really tough to do because you don't have that much time in between games, but half your plate, you want that to be grains or you want that to be carbohydrates because you're using so much energy, so much carbs, you need to keep refueling. So usually when you have, if you have more than half an hour in between your games, you still wanna use this plate. You just don't want it to be a massive plate. You want it to be like smaller, but you still want those carbs, that protein, and then fruits and veggies as well. This has vegetables, but if you're in the middle of a tournament, you do want to have fruits because there's more carbs in it. Any questions about the athlete's plate? That was a very quick overview. <laughs> but for the most part, if you're on a rest day, so right now we're probably all supposed to be using this plate where the key is half your plate, fruits and vegetables. Um, so this is what I've been doing actually, where Monday through Friday, I really make sure that at lunch and dinner at least, I'm having half my plate as, as vegetables and then I have my fruit with breakfast and then on the weekends I kind of go a little crazy, but um, you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> um, however, your practice days, you wanna bring in more carbs and then on those 
tournament days, or maybe you have a two a day, like two practices in one day, uh, or a training session and a practice, you would want to have half your plate of carbohydrates. Um, and then uh, I just want to touch on these last few questions that um, some of you had asked prior to our session today. Um, thank you for putting your questions in. I think I tried to touch on some of the other questions throughout this presentation. Uh, the first question is what are the best foods for tournament days? I kind of touched on this already, but really like you do want those fast, um, those fast acting sugars. So fruits, um, refined carbohydrates, which outside of tournament days, you don't really want to be consuming the refined carbohydrates. Um, but it's totally fine on tournament days because you're burning so much energy and you need so many carbs. Um, also Gatorade, especially, do you guys, does your season go into like the warmer months? Those are for the athletes that continue playing in the off season. So that might be those who play touch football um, out of Toronto, uh, but mostly we finish up by end of March. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So you're playing in the winter, yeah. um, but still you're still burning carbohydrates. And if you are playing throughout that summer period and you're outside, it's like this, like the, um, similar to like indoor and beach volleyball. When you start playing outside, you sweat so much more, you're burning so much more calories. This is when Gatorade would come into play, but, um, just even playing through the winter, you're still burning tons of energy. You can still go for the Gatorade on tournament days only. I wouldn't recommend it for practices, but um, or training sessions, but tournaments for sure, Gatorade would be a good option as well. And maybe Gatorade and water, so you're not depending so much on the Gatorade. Um, another question is, I'll get to the questions in the chat right after these, but continue putting them in because they're very interesting. Um, can nutrition help improve sport mentality and focus on the field? 100%. Um, one of my best friends from high school, she's actually a mental performance coach now. And so we talk about it all the time, how like both of us will always talk about, I'll, I'm always talking about mental performance and she's always talking about nutrition in her presentations. So it's just funny because there's such a connection there. Like if you're not eating enough and your brain doesn't have enough energy, enough glucose, um, it's just not gonna do what it needs to do. So, um, and then also as Olivia mentioned before, like that connection between our gut and our brain, another super important factor, but that's more for stuff that you're doing off the court um, so on your off days, you know, eating lots of fiber, um, on maybe practice days, eating lots of fiber as well. Probiotics, those things are really going to help influence your gut health, which helps influence your mental health. And at the end of the day, um, nutrition is going to be there to support that getting in the zone <laughs> mentally and physically. Um, and then finally, the third question here is, can certain diets improve performance? I really wanted to touch on this one because there's so many fad diets out there. Like the carnivore diet is becoming a big deal. I'm not a fan at all. Olivia, are you a fan from a neural point of view? <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about the amount of like red meats in a diet like that, that could actually be bad for the heart, at least from that standpoint. Yes. Um, in terms of brain, I actually haven't done a lot of studies because I, I do do nutrition based studies. So everything is on like high fat, high sugar diet. So I can tell you that if you eat like shit and work out, I can tell you that your brain may not see the effects as much as the average. But um, with regard to the carnivore diet, I haven't seen much on how it affects the brain. So that's actually interesting. Because I'm very curious because yeah. there's no fiber. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. so, so there's your gut's just not gonna be happy. So carnivore diet, please don't do it. Again, you need carbohydrates and you're not gonna get that from meat. So um, that's just one right there that you just shouldn't do. Um, another popular one is intermittent fasting. And this kind of goes into Olivia's question about calorie deficits, um, where she asked, is calorie deficits even a good idea for athletes? And and well, some athletes need to lose weight to maintain like their weight class, um, rowers and um, boxers, weightlifters. It's really important for those athletes. Um, and some athletes might just want to lose weight, which is completely fine. However, that calorie deficit is going to show up in your athletic performance. So you want to be doing that in the off season. Um, you never want to be doing that during the season because you're just not going to have enough energy to do what you need to do. Um, and also if you are trying to lose weight and go into a calorie deficit, 
you want to make sure that you're eating even more protein than you did before to help maintain that muscle mass. So you're only going to be losing fat mass and you're not going to be losing as much muscle mass because we want to keep that muscle mass um, because it's important for just athletic performance and also overall health. Um, so one of the diets that I wanted to touch on was intermittent fasting, simply because like I do talk about breakfast a lot and it's so important, but I understand like if people are trying to lose weight, um, intermittent fasting might be the best option for you. So again, if you're going to do it, I just recommend that you do it very responsibly. You still follow those key principles of eating before and after practice, um, drinking lots of water throughout the day, and also eating tons of fruits and vegetables, fiber and whole grains and protein as well. Can't forget that. Um, but again, it's kind of the same thing as the calorie deficit where you want to make sure that you're still eating a lot of protein. Um, another diet is the keto diet. This is where you're trying to like completely cut out carbohydrates. Um, there's so much research out there that says that this is not a good, a good diet for athletes, especially football players who are more like, um, you're not really, it's not like endurance running. It's not like that. Like you're kind of on and off for the most part. So you need to be recovering um, when you're off so you can go full out when you're on. And carbs come in as the most important fuel source for that sort of activity. So you carbs really as football players, <laughs> you definitely need carbs. Please do keto. Um, there's also some research out there that shows that a keto diet might actually be detrimental to your um, bone health. It might influence your bone health as well, which we don't want. So we want healthy bones and healthy bodies. So honestly, just a full balanced diet, protein, fiber, carbohydrates, um, fruits and vegetables is probably going to help you a lot. And also another thing that I wanted to mention is that your body, you want to treat it like a car again, whereas like you need gas in order to go anywhere. However, you don't want to give it, they, you're an athlete, like you guys are the Ferraris. <laughs> you have to give your body like premium gas in order to run properly. If you give it regular gas, it's not going to do what it needs to do. And by regular, I'm referring to like junk food, um, carbohydrates um, and sugars that we kind of want to stay away from for the most part. And so you want to give your body premium gas. And by that, I mean, just like whole foods, um, chickpeas, <laughs> legumes, um, anything that has not been super processed. Um, so that's just something to remember when you're meal prepping throughout the week. Again, weekends, you can probably chill out a little bit, but during the week, try to focus on those, those, um, those food principles that we talked about today. Um, and then let me just see if there's any more questions. If you have questions, definitely throw them in the chat. Um, how should you eat when cutting weight? Oh, <laughs> good question. So again, um, you want to cut around 300 to 500 calories. Um, and really this is, I do this work with a lot of clients where we'll sit down and I'll ask them for a whole um, day's worth of what they eat. And we figure out how many calories they're eating overall and compare it to how many calories they actually need to be eating to lose weight. From what they're eating, I'll say, okay, you're eating four snacks a day. Let's try to bump that down to three and get some protein in at snack number three. So you're a little more full. Um, so for the most part, when you're cutting weight, you still want to make sure that you're getting nutrient dense foods, but you're still getting a lot of, um, when eating anything protein, is it possible? It can contribute to weight gain. I mean, for the most part, if you're going to eat more calories than you need, um, there is risk for weight gain. Um, but usually protein sources are actually kind of protective against gaining weight because they make you feel full and they make you feel, um, they make you feel full and they contribute to muscle protein synthesis. So a good weight loss food is to add more or weight loss tip is to add more protein to your meals. Just so you're not hungry throughout the rest of the day. Um, oh, Olivia says we want to hear from her on mental performance. I can bring my girl in. <laughs> her name's Brittany. She did track and field at, um, at a D1 school in the States, which is pretty cool. Um, is breakfast the first meal of the day or before noon? Oh, good question. So 
a lot of athletes might wake up in the morning and feel like they can't really eat anything. Sometimes they're feeling nauseous or bloated, uh, which is very, very common, especially like when you don't have a good sleep or you have to wake up at like 6 a.m. for a training session. <laughs> um, at this point, you just want to try, try to eat anything, whether it's like juice or a smoothie or something, a granola bar um, or yogurt. So usually I try to emphasize that breakfast should be before noon, but I mean, it just really depends. It should be the first meal of the day. And I just want to stress that you want to get in three meals of the day. Um, and it's just typical for breakfast to be before noon. But if you wake up at, at 1130 and your breakfast is at 1230, that's fine too. Just make sure you get in two more meals <laughs> before the end of the day. <laughs> Um, Amanda asked if I do meal plans. I do, but honestly, I'm not a huge fan of the meal plans because they're really hard to follow. Like creating kind of like a prescription is super hard to follow. So usually when I work with clients and they're trying to either lose weight or gain weight, I'm like, okay, uh, at breakfast, you need more protein. Um, and that's going to prevent you from going for snack for two snacks before lunchtime. Um, so breakfast, let's add um, X amount of protein with these foods. And so sometimes goals can be that I set with my clients can be something as simple as um, add a vegetable to this meal and see what happens. And usually it results in what they want. It's just because a meal plan, it's really hard to follow. And once you miss one day, it's really hard to get back on the horse and try to follow up for the next two weeks. Um, so I usually try to do goals that you can do every single day um, and that will contribute to helping you meet your overall goal. Um, and then what are your thoughts on diet products such as pop that contains aspartame? This is a good question. There's a lot of research out there about, um, sweeteners and, um, like no sugar drinks. And honestly, if you are somebody who drinks Coca-Cola, that's like the regular Coca-Cola, I would recommend that you go to diet Coca-Cola simply because that's just the next step to helping you reduce that um, calorie consumption and all that sugar. Um, and usually there's so much research to show that there isn't, there's no health risk with drinking like maybe two cans of diet Coke a day. However, um, I think it's phenyl, it's one of the amino acids that there are people who can't really um, metabolize it properly. And so one of the sweeteners will result in, um, in an uh, this, um, what's it called? Wow, I'm losing my words right now. Um, condition, condition. <laughs> so if you don't have any pre-existing health condition or underlying health condition that prevents you from having a sweetener, you're probably okay to have like one or two cans a day. But also like, I'm not a big fan of pop at all. I just think it's um, most of the time empty calories and I get that they taste great. Um, so if you are a big pop drinker, try to switch the diet option. And then from there, try to switch to something else that could be water or like sweetened water um, or even the Mio's are a good option. But um, for the most part, I would rather you drink. Yeah, bubbly works too. I would rather you drink um, a diet beverage than something that's full sugar, simply from like the nutrition perspective and diabetes and everything like that. So it's like the lesser of two evils. <laughs> any other questions? Let me see if I have any more slides here. Oh, no, that's it. This is where you can find me on Instagram and my website. I have some blog posts there that you might find interesting. There's a couple recipes. There's a chickpea recipe that I recommend you all try because chickpeas are fantastic um, and they're very good for you. So um, that's my, I guess that's it for me. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you guys are super engaged, tons of questions. Um, it's, I wish I could be here in person doing this because it's, um, it's great that you're engaged, but I, I can't see anybody's faces. <laughs> so I, I would love kidding. to come and meet you all. You can, Sorry? that was so awesome. That was Thank like you. very informative, super engaging. Like even though the chat and it's not the same as talking, you were really, really great at um, keeping an eye on it and bringing everyone in. So thank you everyone for attending. Yes, um, thank you. 
this was awesome. I've recorded it so we can talk about how we, what we do after with that um, once everyone's gone. But um, thank you so much for attending. Again, I remind you all to come out to our next events. They're going to be just as great as this one. Although our speakers do have some competition. So <laughs> that, was, that was like actually great. I think uh, you answered a lot of the questions that I always think about every time I make a meal. Um, on the <laughs> um, if anyone wants to reach out to Asia, she has her information on the screen. Uh, please share her contact, her socials, because she does have some great tips on there as well, especially if you are a coach and you have athletes or you know a fellow athletes or you're training with someone. But um, we'll leave it at that. I'm going to hang around for another five minutes. Um, Asia, you're welcome to stay as well. And if anyone wants to ask some more personal questions and turn on your cam and talk to us, you're welcome to as well. Uh, next event is on the 19th. Thank you everybody for coming. It was so nice to meet you all. The chat was popping. It was popping. <laughs> I feel like an event, like a game host. <laughs> I like that. I just off. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, this lineup sounds great. Yeah, but now I'm like, we need more of the, the young gals who know how to do it right. So right when you said your friend is um, a mental health performance coach, like that's, that's huge, so. Yeah, I'll definitely provide her contact information. She's lit. She's actually doing it full time right now. So um, I'm like happy to help connect her with anybody. That'd be awesome. Let me put, I'm going to send you an email of like the FODMAPs and okay. vitamin D levels. And then also um, my friend's contact. Yeah. Then I'll, we'll share them on our socials and then, oh yeah. What would you like to do with, I recorded it. Oh, let me stop this one.